in a land shrouded by shadows. From the country of Evilton, Lord Doom arises to dominate the world and bring power to his faction because... I don't know, I ran out of energy before the motivation hit me. As a faction, Evilton and Lord Doom as its leader sucks. And unfortunately, all too often, this is how world builders create evil factions because all they actually need is an opponent to battle against or something like that. And then by contrast, they will make the good faction, the shining beacon of awesomeness, the glory that is the church of the purity that stands against Lord Doom and all that is wicked. But the problem with that is it is also without nuance. It has no depth to it. And that is what I would like to combat today. I would like to strike a blow for good world building and talk about how to create factions with nuance and conflict and complications. And also, four strategies for how to come up with a really good name. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time World Building with your host, Marie Mullaney. This episode is brought to you by the members of my channel who have had access to this episode for well over a month. Join the channel for great perks like early access. Right, enough of that, let's crack on. One thing to bear in mind as we go through this process of faction creation is that all of the elements we will talk about today and we'll be talking about motivation, identification, names and history, and alliances in factions, to mention only a few. All of these elements together form a whole. So, don't treat them as isolated steps. Your name might come from the faction's history. Your faction alliances might be influenced by their motivation. The means the faction is willing to use might have changed due to historical events and so on. So, while I'm going to talk about each concept individually, of course they all form a whole and you should complete these steps or these concepts in whatever crazy, messy way works for your world building process. Okay, so with that out of the way, Let's dive into the first element of faction creation, possibly the most important. Faction motivation. Faction motivation is a critical aspect of building your faction. It's essential to understand what your faction desires, both in terms of its long-term purpose and its immediate short-term goals. This understanding is crucial when characters encounter the faction, whether in a story or during a campaign. Keep in mind that the long-term purpose might not align with the immediate goals, except perhaps in the grand vision of the faction's leader or its council. In discussing motivation, it is also important to consider the means the faction aims to achieve its goals with. The methods employed can significantly define the faction's tone. For example, a faction willing to use assassins to achieve noble ends might possess a rotten core beneath its golden exterior. This complexity creates a faction that explores themes of whether the end justifies the means. Conversely, 
a faction aiming to take control of a country through lawful strategies, aiming for a just society, underscores the belief that poisoning the roots of an endeavor will never yield good fruit. This introduces the theme that the fruit of a poison tree cannot bear good fruit. And those underlying thematic elements is why it's important to contemplate not just what motivates your faction, but also the red lines the faction won't cross and what means they routinely use to achieve their aim. A prime example of a faction with clear motivation providing a rich source of conflict is the Night's Watch from George R. R. Martin's A Game of Thrones. Their sole goal is to protect the realm from threats beyond the wall, and this shapes their culture, their traditions, and even the oath that they swear. However, within the Night's Watch, opinions deserve uh, opinions diverge on what means to use. For example, when John brings the wildlings into the fold to stand against the others, or the white walkers as the show terms, terms them, there is a faction that sees these wildlings as equivalent to aiding the others, and John's actions are seen as a betrayal which leads to internal conflict and ultimately his unaliving. And this scenario perfectly illustrates how internal conflict can arise in a faction when certain actions are perceived as crossing established red lines. So, when conceptualizing your faction, consider their long-term goals, their short-term objectives, their customary means, what they normally use, and their non-negotiable boundaries. And remember, factions within factions can offer fertile ground for compelling narratives. And if you found this exploration of faction motivations insightful, hit that thumbs up button and stay tuned as we delve into faction history. A faction's history creates the cultural and ideological depth that seamlessly integrates your faction into your world. When considering factions in the real world, their richness comes from how far back their histories extend and the predecessors from which they evolve. Take, for example, the Hanseatic League, which dominated European trade networks during the Middle Ages. Out of the Hanseatic Guild, out of the Hanseatic League and other merchant guilds of it like, evolved the companies that led the age of exploration and eventually led into companies as we understand them today. This kind of evolution over time adds layers of intrigue and complexity to factions in your world. Now, while it's important to build this history, it's also important not to overwhelm yourself with the details. You don't want to build something as deep as the Hanseatic League unless it's going to be core to your story. So just make sure you have a sense of your faction's history and highlight a few milestones. And for guidance on how to highlight those milestones, consider, faction, consider elements like how the leadership selection works now in the current day and age, and how the leadership selection worked in the past. Maybe previously it was an hereditary form of leadership, and now it's elected by a board. Also think about whether this faction carries the scars of internal or external conflicts, such as trade wars for a merchant guild, or ideological divides similar to the Night Watch conflicts over the wildlings. Or perhaps there have been schisms and there are now two factions that are nearly the same. So how have these conflicts shaped the faction's rules and relationships? Examining alliances is also key here. For example, the vampire courts in the Dresden Files maintain a loose network of alliances 
shaped by a long history of cooperation and conflict. And understanding the history behind these alliances can reveal much about the faction's current position and strategies. Another aspect to consider is the faction's impact and perception within the world. Does the world view the faction as a force for good or evil? Is the faction actively working to change the world? The Bene Gesserit from Dune serves as a prime example of a faction with a long and complex history involving numerous other factions, and their strategic seeding of myths across the universe, which Jessica leverages among the Fremen, illustrates the deep and intricate planning that defined their long-term influence. So, when crafting your faction's history, Think about how leadership is chosen in the current and past. Think about conflicts and the evolution of alliances and mark those milestones. This historical backdrop not only enriches your factions, but also provides fertile ground for writing compelling narratives. And if you enjoyed this exploration of faction histories, hit that thumbs up button and let's talk about faction identification, including that naming strategy that I promised you. Faction symbology is the first element of identification that I want to talk about, and it is a crucial element of world building, providing an immediate means to identify and understand a faction. This aspect encompasses the symbols, clothing, or jewelry or any other identification symbols associated with the faction. Consider the noble houses in George R. R. Martin's works. The dire wolf signifies House Stark, the lion symbolizes the Lannisters, and the stag represents the Baratheons. These symbols are central to the identity of these factions, emphasized repeatedly to embed them in the audience's mind. Martin even explores internal faction conflict through symbology, as seen with the Targaryen's green and black dragons in the lore of the Dance of Dragons. The Dresden Files offers another excellent example, where Harry Dresden's disregard for the traditional robe and stole of the White Council highlights his rebellious nature against the centuries-old tradition. This contrast only works because of the established formalities and symbology showcasing the importance of the identity of the White Council. Symbology extends beyond visual identifiers. It can also signify rank and affiliation within the faction, similar to the varied colors and shapes of academic regalia that denote different schools and ranks within our world's universities. So by having these different symbols for rank and departments, you create a world where you can show a character's advancement through the ranks of their factions, and a world where you can show authority within a faction. This can facilitate decision-making processes or even heighten the tensions of political scenes where you can show the rank of one character being used to bludgeon another just by having that character, for example, flash the ring that indicates their rank within the hierarchy. So, symbology is very important. Equally important is the titles that go with those symbols. What is the leader of the faction called? What are the officers or the rank and file or the juniors, the guys who've just entered the faction? What are they called? These elements all make up the faction's identification elements. But let's face it, nothing is more important than the name. And making up names that don't suck is hard. So let's identify four naming strategies. First, 
Etymological foundations is a strategy that draws from ancient or foreign languages, mythology, or historical references to create names that have a deep, inherent meaning. This strategy can lend an air of ancient wisdom, mystique, or gravitas to a faction. For example, a faction focused on knowledge and wisdom might draw from the Latin word sapienta, wisdom, leading to a name like sapient order or guardians of sapientia. The second strategy is a descriptive naming strategy which uses names that clearly reflect the faction's characteristics or purpose, which helps immediately ground the faction in the audience's understanding. For example, a faction that protects a sacred forest might be named Green Ward Guardians or Forest Sentinel Alliance. Now, this does have a potential pitfall. Be careful not to be too on the nose or too pedestrian. And the third strategy will help you with that because That uses the rest of the symbology to build your name. A great example of this is the god of King's Landing from A Song of Ice and Fire, who are called the Gold Cloaks because of the cloaks that they wear. It's descriptive, it's memorable, and it also reflects their status as town gods of a rich city. Lastly, consider symbolic or or allegorical names which add layers of meaning, representing the faction's underlying themes or values. For this approach, identify symbols, animals, or natural elements that embody the faction's spirit or mission. For instance, the Night Watch from A Song of Ice and Fire symbolizes the guardians against the dark threats of winter rather than being literal night watchers. In applying these strategies, I do want to emphasize one essential caveat. It, you have to make sure that while these names fit your culture, while they fit your linguistics, and while they fit your faction, they must be pronounceable. If your readers cannot pronounce that name, it's going to be in the one ear and out the other, and they will never catch on to any of the depth of the faction. Because quite simply, if a reader can't say it, they can't tell other people about it. And if you enjoyed this exploration of faction identification and especially naming strategies, hit that thumbs up button and let's talk about the plot elements that are opened up by factions. Exploring faction dynamics can significantly enrich your narrative, offering a myriad complex and engaging plot elements. One compelling device is the surprise breakaway character, where a faction known for something has a member that breaks away from this. The typical example is a faction known for extreme loyalty having one member that unthinkably betrays somebody. This unexpected turn of events can throw established narratives into chaos, creating a rich ground for further development. A notable example is the Sook Doctor Wellington Yu in Dune. Despite the Sook Doctor's renowned control against betrayal, Yu's family is leveraged by the Harkonnens to coerce his treachery. This plot twist is shocking due to the meticulous setup of the Sook Doctor's loyalty, making Yu's betrayal a pivotal moment that upends the story's direction. Another instance found in Kashil's Chosen by Jacqueline Carey, where a member of the Castelline Brotherhood betrays his queen Now, his motivations are different from Yu's. Instead of coming from his family being endangered, they stem from a deep personal grudge 
And that illustrates how complex backgrounds and personal histories can lead to factional betrayal. This betrayal is at the heart of the book's conflict, showcasing the intricate dynamics within seemingly monolithic institutions. So that's the breakaway member plot. But you can also lean into conflict between factions. Dune absolutely exemplifies this, with the animosity between House Harkonnen and House Atreides, as well as between the Fremen and House Harkonnen, and the Emperor himself. These conflicts drive much of the narrative, demonstrating how interfactional struggles can form the backbone of a story. But of course, it's not all between factions. Internal faction conflicts offer equally rich narratives. The White Council in the Dresden Files is a prime example of this, where has it the Harry Dresden initially stands as an outsider and gradually becomes embroiled in the council's internal politics. In time, he finds out that there is a dark faction in the council and he has to actively work to oppose it. This evolution reveals the complexities within the White Council where differing ideologies and agendas can lead to significant strife, even inside an organization. And lastly, portraying a faction under pressure can highlight its vulnerabilities and its external and internal conflicts. The Night's Watch in A Song of Ice and Fire is constantly battling insufficient resources and disbelief in the threat they guard against. When this threat intensifies, the decision to integrate the wildlings exacerbates internal tensions leading to a factional split, and indeed, Jon Snow's unaliving. This scenario underscores how external pressures can catalyze critical changes within a faction, impacting the broader narrative landscape. When you are building your factions in your world, you want to consider the following questions. 1. What motivates your faction? Remember, it's not about power and probably not about money. It's about a concrete goal that they're looking to achieve with that power and money. 2. What will they do and what won't they do? In other words, what means will they use and what are their red lines? 3. What is your faction's history what are the milestones and what is their current situation? Four, what identifies your faction? And five, what purpose do they serve in your plot? Remember, don't build what you don't need. So build the factions that you need, not factions that you think might be useful. This video has been brought to you by the members of my channel who are the amazing leaders of my faction. And a special thanks to Tony, Dylan, Scott and Tiffany. If you would like to join their ranks for as little as 3 euros a month, you too can get all of these cool perks. But please don't feel pressured to support the channel financially. You can also show your support just by watching another video. Since you enjoyed this video, you might also enjoy my video on creating a merchant guild. Or you could trust the algorithm with its recommendation right over there and help the channel by showing the algorithm that my videos have traction. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds where we build what we need when we need it.